How is everybody today? Hope that you are all seeing and hearing. Okay. And our captioning will start in just a few minutes. Uh, so we do have uh, oh, a bunch of people online. That's terrific. <clears throat> so just bear with us as we get the captioning going. And hopefully once the okay. captioning is on, uh, you'll be able to see a CC button on your screen. And that's what you will activate to get the captions. Just as a reminder to please put yourself on mute and stay on mute until and unless you wish to ask a question. So Nancy, I think I was hearing you typing in your papers. So if you wanna go on mute until I turn it over to you, uh, you should see a little microphone that you can click on to mute yourself. Okay. Uh, so this presentation is being recorded and it'll be available upon request. Uh, it does take us a while because AT3 has been sending out the recordings to get the captions cleaned up. So uh, if you need it before it's posted, I can send you the link, but would encourage you to look at it uh, just really quickly uh, because then we need to remove the link from our archives to send it out. And so you may have noticed in the uh, community of practice section on the AT3 website that uh, we don't have the archived videos from the last several months yet but we are expecting them to come up, uh, to come back from being cleaned up shortly. And just as an announcement to make sure you have it on your schedule, the next COP is going to be June 10th, at, which is a different date. <coughs> yeah, so, I am hearing other people uh, making noise. So again, please make sure that your mics are muted. Okay, uh, so we're gonna get started now. <coughs> Excuse me. And I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to, <coughs> Excuse me to uh, Nancy from iGaze, who will be giving you a great presentation, a little bit of iGaze 101, then talking about her product and discounts and deals. So <coughs> let me turn that over. <coughs> Nancy, I think you can uh, take over the control now. Okay. Hi, yeah. everybody. Um, I've not, not done this type of webinar before, so bear with me if I screw it up. Just somebody let me know. Um, 30 seconds of background. I'm a, a registered nurse. I'm an old ER nurse. And um, about 30 years ago, I married a guy who was an engineer who had this crazy idea to make a computer you could run with your eyes. I offered to help him for a few weeks, and here it is 30 years later, and I'm still doing this. So I've got a good depth of knowledge of eye tracking and disabilities and what works and what doesn't work. And I'm going to throw in with this presentation just a little bit of, as, as Amy said, eye gaze 101, because I think it's valuable. For those of you who know this stuff, I apologize, but 
in general, I think it will be useful information. So LC Technologies is the company. The product is the eye gaze edge. Whoop, why is that? Well, right off the bat, my arrow is not working. I, I, I think Amy's watching oh. the screen. She hasn't relinquished her. I think I can't control the screen yet, Amy. So she needs to view the share. There it is. Let's see if it works share now. Screen, share. All right, so now you should be good to go. Nope. <laughs> yep, yeah, you're good. There we go. You're good. This is what an eye gaze edge tablet looks like. I kind of wish I'd put in a picture of what it looked like 30 years ago. For those of you that are old enough to remember DOS-based computers and big VGA monitors, that's what we had. And that was state-of-the-art technology and um, was really crazy and innovative compared to what people have these days. So over the years, these systems have gotten smaller, faster, less expensive, and more accurate. We do something different than other eye tracking companies. We keep the camera separate. And one of the reasons we do that is because we use a single source of infrared light on the user's eye. I don't know, does this arrow show up when I point at this on the screen? I don't know if it does or doesn't. Okay. Yes, it does. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I should back it up then. And, and just show you, this is the only light source that's shining on the user's eyes. Because I'm a nurse, I'm a patient advocate like no other. And I have real issues with how, with how much light we put on somebody's eyes, particularly when the eye is the only method somebody has for communicating. So we have stuck with this idea of a single source of infrared light, one LED, to run the system for the whole history of the company. I thought it'd be kind of fun to see a little bit of a user and what somebody can actually do. This is a fairly old video, but I love this guy. Um, he was actually timed by the speech therapist working with him. He typed something like 34 words a minute. This was no word prediction. This is direct selection. And this is the guy. We have concentrated on speed and accuracy. If anybody here is here from Michigan, Lisa Bardak took this. So you can see he's typing quite fast. Uh, okay, we're going to move it on, I think, if I can. Nancy, are we supposed to be hearing audio on that? Yeah. It's very difficult to hear. Okay, he just said, he's just, uh, probably it's not Mike. It's, he, said, I'm, uh, he said, I'll buy the first round of drinks at the golf alley. Sure, I don't want to watch this webinar. Okay, enough of that. I just wanted you to see that this is something that people are pretty fast doing. Uh, faster, maybe with word prediction, maybe not, depending on. Um, Please come to the front desk. Tom, come to the front desk. About word prediction. Um, what can you do with an eye gaze edge? This is pretty standard stuff for all of the uh, higher end eye gaze systems. Um, you can obviously communicate, you can use a banked voice if you want, you can type a document or write a book. We're up to 15 books now. Uh, email, surf the web, control Amazon Echo, uh, watch YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon, et cetera. Read books, play music, watch video, et cetera, et cetera. And use the eye gaze edge as a keyboard and mouse interface to control another computer. And that makes people quite employable. It really is a, a, the great equalizer. Um, so this is eye gaze 101. All eye gaze systems need to have some sort of calibration because eye gaze systems are done by tracking the radius of curvature of the eyeball and figuring out where light is reflected on that surface. Obviously, if you don't calibrate, you cannot figure out the radius of surface of an eyeball. It's, it's pretty simple math. Um, the technique that's used by all the systems is called pupil center corneal reflection method. And it's because it's quite a good way to be able to see 
somebody's gaze, where somebody's gaze point is. So if you look at this image, of, these are the same eye, that's a field of view and that's a close up. So these are <coughs> of our systems. And you see a dot in the center of the pupil, that's a tracking, na that's a knack that's put on by the software that says, I've got the center of your pupil. This is a reflection on the cornea. And if you look at these pictures, you'll see that the reflection on the cornea changes its location in relation to which way the eye is pointed. This is why eye tracking is done across the board by looking at images of the eye and tracking where somebody is looking based on the location of the corneal reflection in relation to the center of the pupil. I'm trying to figure out what's coming up next here. Well, let's just go to the next one and see. So mapping the radius of curvature and eyeballs are shaped differently. So I have some issues with the idea that you can use somebody else's calibration if you want high accuracy. And I, that's a big caveat for me because I recognize that there are a lot of little kids that are doing pretty basic stuff with their eyes. And this is overkill for a little kid doing basic stuff with their eyes. They don't need this kind of accuracy. Um, but the bottom line is your calibration won't work accurately for me. I'll be able to do something, but it won't be accurate. I actually wanted to show you guys calibration. Some of you may have seen this at a conference, but our calibration is totally automated, meaning that once you get, this, get it started, you don't have to do anything. The system will take care of doing retakes if necessary, moving to the next point, that's all automated. So this is a very short little video about that. They can't hear it. So you might want to just explain. Nancy, we're not hearing the audio from your on. video. Let me stop it if I can. I don't know how to stop it. Gotcha. Okay. They can't hear anything. Oh. Hang on. Hmm. Wonder if you use computer audio instead of the headsets. Headset. I would just as soon do that, to be yeah. honest with you. She said use computer audio rather than the headset. Mm, That's okay. maybe why. Hang on a second while we sort this out then. Sorry about this. We've never used this particular um, program before. You can just unplug it maybe. A lot of people talk about ease of calibration with an eye gaze system. Can you hear it now? I think the eye gaze edge is by far the easiest system to calibrate, often taking no more. It's quiet, but we can hear it. I'll turn it on. It. So if you are doing an assessment and trying to calibrate. Oh, God. Hang on. <laughs> often taking no more than 15 uh, seconds. It's all automated. So. If you are doing an assessment and trying to calibrate someone, you don't have to do anything but let the system do the work. So here's a calibration screen and the camera's in a James's eye. Here are images of the eye, both a close up and a field of view of the camera. And I'm going to focus that a little bit better so it's a clear image. On the screen, it says look at the camera to begin, that's for a user. Or if you're doing an assessment, there's a button that says start calibration and one that says skip calibration if you are starting over, but you want Can to you use hear it now? existing calibration that you've been using. Now I'm going to cover the camera because if I don't, James is immediately going to calibrate. Yes. The Thank I'm you. I'm going to do this and I'm going to hit start calibration and the first point is up there and I'm going to un take my hand from in front of the camera so I can see James's eye and he's going to begin the process of calibrating. So you can see how quickly it goes. He fixes his gaze on each of these points for about a third of a second. And I'm going to hit the space bar to stop this when it's done. Okay, I've hit the space bar to stop it because it happened so fast he would go right into the system. He's done now. And I'm, Jeremy, I don't know if you can get in closer than, than you are now, but 
you'll have to take my word for it that on top of each of these yellow dots, there's a red X. And that's the point that the system thinks James was looking. And they're sitting right on top of those, those yellow dots, so you can't probably see them from where you are. Up on the left corner of the screen, and I think this is critical, calibration accuracy. So what the system does automatically, besides calculating the calibration, it tells you what that is. And I think that's really valuable when you're trying to assess someone's ability to use the system. This calibration accuracy is 0.15 inches. If I double that number to 0.3 inches, that's the size cell that a user with that calibration can successfully activate. So this was very fast and very accurate. If I take the keyboard lock off, I stop this with the keyboard, I'm gonna take it off. And then James, would you go into a keyboard and just go across the row of letters? Sure. This is a gaze duration of four tenths of a second. Again, very, very fast. What he's typing is appearing on the top of the screen. So calibration is very quick and very accurate. I wanted to show that because um, many of our users are high functioning, fully employed, working full time or part time, and they're doing stuff with keyboards. And you can't do keyboards all day if you don't have good accuracy and speed. Our eyes move in saccades about three times a second. They're constantly moving. And it's really uncomfortable to slow your eyes down. They want to keep moving. So we've designed keyboards where the user determines the speed down to a tenth of a second, which is really too fast cognitively to manage. I've seen 0.15 or 0 0.0.15, um, but not a tenth of a second. Um, we only track one eye. This is something we thought about 30 years ago. We assumed that some users would not have two functioning eyes and depending on two eyes might be a dangerous route to go down. So from day one, our systems have tracked one eye. We have two eye systems, binocular systems. It's not necessary. The difference in accuracy is negligible for this particular application. Um, advantages of doing that is for somebody with strabismus, you're only tracking one eye. So you don't run into the issues of uh, which gaze point is really the gaze point. Uh, either eye can be selected and used, and we're only shining light on one eye, so it's less fatiguing. Fatigue's an issue with eye gaze systems. Um, turns out running a system does not cause eye muscle fatigue. Our eye muscles are not capable of fatigue. In fact, they are much like, this is weird, but true, the, the uh, muscles in birds' wings don't fatigue. Birds can fly 24 hours a day and just keep going, and our eyes never stop the whole time we're alive, whether we're awake or asleep. Because it's not the ocular muscles that are fatiguing, fatigue is really caused by eye strain from blinking more often. And it's the eyelid muscles that do fatigue, and it's worse in bright lights. So turn down the light. Because we use one LED, there is a lot less light illumination on the eye than any other eye gaze system. We also use non-glare screens because that's fatiguing to have to try to pick out something on a screen when there's reflections from a window. And we do not use screens with white or bright background colors because we found over the years that less light means less blinking and less fatigue for users. Our premise is that you're gonna be using this system from the time you get up in the morning till you go to bed at night. As far as I know, this is the only system in the world that can handle significant ptosis of the eyelid and still work with accuracy. And the reason for that is that instead of sort of drawing crosshairs in image processing to find the pupil center, the system takes a series of cuts of the edge of the pupil, any part that's visible, draws in the missing piece and finds the center. And that's critical because that's where your vision's originating from. Medriasis is a problem with people that are taking baclofen. And this little kid has medriasis. He does not have a disability. He actually got into a plant in the yard and rubbed one eye 
and came in and freaked out his parents. This was the picture was taken by an ER doctor and he figured out that this child was uh, exhibiting medriasis from a reaction to a plant. Now it turns out that even though this eye looks like there's something wrong with it, it's this eye, the dilated pupil that did not constrict when the camera flash went off. So you can see in this little boy that his left eye, if you flip it to the, at his left, um, that pupil's constricted because that's protecting his eye. His right eye is incapable of doing that because of the medriasis. So we think that this system is less exhausting for people with medriasis because there's not so much light shining on the eye. System also tracks uh, with unusually small pupils quite accurately. We don't need a ton of pupil image to be visible in order for it to track. And it often works with nystagmus. If the, nyst the nystigmatic rate, the bounce rate of the eye is not more often than about three times per second, our simple calibration may and often does accommodate. Uh, the simple calibration only requires you to fix your gaze on a point for about a quarter of a second. So if your eye's bouncing less frequently than that, in between bounces, the fixation when you look at a calibration point is sufficient for the system to capture that information and to take that and come up with a good calibration. The downside to that is someone with nystagmus who can calibrate that way will have to have a pretty fast dwell time, a gaze duration on their system so that they can stay in a key long enough to trigger it. So it's got a bigger learning curve, but it is doable and there are users of our system that have pretty significant nystagmus. Because we only track one eye and because our droopy eyelid compensation works in any direction, you can be lying on your side and the camera can be pointed at the eye that's visible. Typically, it's the eye that's on top. The other one might be in a pillow. So this eye is the one that would be tracked. And it can be tracked because the system will organize itself to figure out what the eyeball is doing, no matter what direction it is in relation to the screen. If you look at the screen, it's not turned sideways. For many people, that's really difficult to manage. It would be like turning your television sideways when you're lying on the couch. We just don't do that. We're used to seeing our entire environment in the same plane, including the television screen, even when we're lying on our sides. So for people that need to have their positions changed frequently, the, the uh, system can, can be calibrated to either eye in about 15 seconds if this little boy turned over to the other side his system could be moved around to the other side. The eye that's visible could be calibrated again and he could continue to operate the system. Eyeballs are shaped differently, so you can't use the same calibration when you roll over, but um, it doesn't take a whole lot of time to take care of that. Okay, this is something I threw in because in my years of working with eye gaze systems, I realize that people don't understand that there are two types of eye movement and the one that everybody sees as, oh yes, this person is a good candidate for eye gaze is pretty meaningless. So the ability to follow a moving target is called visual pursuit. If um, you hold your finger up in front of somebody's face and doctors do this when you have a physical sometimes and say, follow my finger, that's visual pursuit. So you are putting your eyes on a target and as that target moves, your eye moves with them. Calibration is visual pursuit. That does not mean that you can run an eye gaze system. The eye gaze system is run using volitional control. The difference being you can take your eyes and decide you're gonna to look to the left or to the right or in any direction. And the way to assess for that, I threw this in because this is really useful if you're going to travel a distance to see somebody or they're going to travel a distance to see you. You ask the person to look up, down, left, right, and then at the camera. And you do that without any prompting. With a little child, you would probably say, look at mom who's standing to the left, look at dad who's standing to the right, look at the balloon that somebody's holding up in the air, and look at the floor. You have to figure out a way to do it without 
a moving target because this isn't going to tell you anything. I once saw a man, he was actually the guy that developed Deck Talk. For those of you that remember Deck Talk, he developed ALS and was so locked in that he could calibrate beautifully and he could not move his eyes at all to do anything on the screen. The last calibration point is where his eyes were stuck and they never went any further than that. So it's good to know that before you try to assess somebody. If they're not capable of volitional control, they're not gonna be able to use an eye gaze system. This is eye world. This is our version of the grid. Uh, we put a lot of thought into how to create this so that it was comfortable and intuitive and pretty and something you could look at all day. I'm not gonna go through all these programs. I'm going to do a, a brief pass through of them just so you can see what kind of options there are. I think these are pretty standard uh, grid options. Internet and computer access and remote control and alarm, et cetera, et cetera. There's a couple of screens of them. We, have, we're, we can control an Amazon Echo. And significant in this is the fact that we have training videos for all of the features in iWorld so that a user at his leisure can figure out how to do all this stuff. As these systems have gotten more and more complicated, I get more and more overwhelmed trying to keep up with well, all the features and how they work. And by putting videos in the program for the user, they're able to master the skills that they think are most important and in the amount of time that they want to. So here's a keyboard. You've probably seen similar ones. More and more people are starting to gravitate towards darker colors, which makes me happy. Um, if you look at that image on the left-hand side, there is the image of the eye. That's the other thing that we put on all our screens so that a user can tell. If you're looking at something on a keyboard and it's not responding, maybe it's because your head's shifted to the side and the camera can't see your eyes anymore, and you have no way of knowing that unless you can see what the camera sees. So every screen in our system gives the user information about what the camera sees of his eyes. So if it's not working correctly, he knows it and doesn't sit there frustrated trying to figure out why it's not working. Uh, this is the internet. These are um, various programs you can access through the internet. Um, I would be doing Amazon probably and Netflix of this bunch. Every screen also has a pause key on it and every screen um, has the pause key in the same area and the home key in the same area so that there's consistent consistency for the users. This is the Kindle app. This is tremendously popular with people. And even on this one, there's a tiny little image of the eye so that the person reading the book can see what uh, is seen of his eye. Uh, this is a training video. And this is, I think that we can play this. I'm gonna play about 10 seconds of this just so you get a sense of what it, and these are much more colorful screens. The guy that created the video wasn't thinking about the colors as he did it. Have select all, cut, copy, paste, and undo. So if you get select all, it's gonna select everything on the web page, as you can see, and you can then copy it, and you can go paste it anywhere. So I, that's all I wanted to show you, just to get a sense that it's very, uh, interactive on the presentation side so that you can see what um, Jamal's doing as he's teaching it. And this is the entertainment application, iWorld Entertainment, and it has music and videos. Uh, Kindle can be combined in here and some systems it is. But if you look over to the left-hand side, I put when if you pause a video, wherever you pause it, it'll stay there until you shut it down so you can go back to it later. And in this case, the video that's paused is the same one I was just showing. iWorld, this is remote control stuff. A set-top box is, an, is a cable box. I don't know why that didn't get renamed for the United States, because that's very British to call it a cable box. But um, And these keys, of course, because it's done in the grid, can be removed if there are keys that you don't want. They don't have to be there. That's pretty straightforward to edit and change. Uh, Windows control, so you can go out onto the desktop and play games or do whatever you want to do that way. I think this is really critically important. This is our sleep mode, and 
if you want, if a user wants to be able to call people in the middle of the night, if they're sleeping and they need some help, they can do it by uh, looking at the eye gaze screen. So the screen's left in a position where it can see the user's eyes. The screen goes black when you activate it. If you wake up and you need help, if you open your eyes and look at the screen, it's not gonna make a sound, it's gonna pop up with an option for you to call your caregiver. And I think this gives people a lot of security in the middle of the night that if something goes wrong, if they don't feel well, in between times when a caregiver is in there with them or checking on them, they can call for help. We also have children's programs, uh, again, done in the grid, but we took all these programs and we changed the colors so that they're not so intense because so many children are on baclofen and have these big dilated pupils. And this is interactive learning screens. These are just some samples of the of the various screens. This is another one for children. And this is one of my favorites. These are the books that have been written by our users. And they've done it because it's fast and accurate and easy to, um, to write using the system. The slide that isn't in here that I thought I had put in here is one that shows computer access. And the way that works is by remotely controlling a PC, a Mac, a Linux system from the iGaze screen. So you bring up a keyboard and a mouse control screen on iGaze and you position the computer you want to run next to it, above it, below it, to the side, across the room, doesn't matter. You need to be able to see the screen, but all the navigation actually takes place right on the um, the screen, the computer you're running as well as on the iGaze screen and that happens in real time. So if you're typing something, you're gonna type on the iGay screen and in real time, it's gonna show up in the Word document or whatever document it is that you're using on your own computer. This has actually allowed a scientist to continue working in a, in a, in a top secret facility. He could use iGay as his keyboard and mouse and continue to do his research. And that's not unique. A number of people have done that sort of thing. We're kind of proud of that. The latest book to be to come out is this one called X to the Nth, and uh, it was released last week. I just bought it on Amazon, and it is a 400-page science fiction novel. So it gives you a sense of the ability of people to write with their eyes. This is what the system looks like. This is we we supply it with a bag. The bag holds the computer. This this little case is for the camera and the cables, everything fits in here, keyboard. It comes with a keyboard. If you're gonna do editing, it's a whole lot easier to do it from a keyboard than it is to do it from touchscreen. It is a touchscreen system. Because of the, it comes with the grid, it is possible to use it with other access methods as well as with the eyes, just like any other program in the grid. And this is our AT3 center discount. And it's the, the tablet, the eye tracking and camera package, the a table mount with an articulating arm, the backpack and camera case, essentially all the stuff that you've seen, um, plus the computer access, which I apologize for not having in here, and um, a full day of training by LC staff. So if you choose to get one of these systems, what we ideally would do is spend an afternoon one day and a morning the next day doing training so that this, your staff would have time to play with the system, think of questions overnight and come back the next day and get answers to the questions. When these systems go out the door, we wanna be sure that people understand fully how to use them. We also have TeamViewer and do a lot of support with that or with Skype. Uh, these systems are in 46 countries and in many of those countries, there is not a distributor. Uh, somebody local and we support them remotely and do a pretty decent job of that. I think that's the end of my, oh, one more. I think that's the end of my presentation. I'm kind of sorry I don't have the computer access thing in there. Do you have that video on your computer? I guess there's no way to do it on short notice um, to show you the computer access, but it's pretty cool. So, now would be a great time if people have any questions. 
You can either turn your mic on and ask your question or ask it in the chat box and I'm happy to read it for Nancy. Hmm. Yeah, we don't I don't I don't have a tech box, a text box. Anybody have a question? I have a question. I don't know if you can hear me though. Yep, can hear you fine. Who is yep. this? This is Tracy Rue from the Vermont Assistive Technology Program. Hi, Tracy. I was curious to know about the individual that worked in the classified facility, whether or not the software that he needed for his research was installed directly on his device. Because I'm working with a client now who has cerebral palsy that works for the state government. Um, and that would be a challenge with IT, I think, uh, how to access any specialized programming that he might need on, on a laptop. That's an excellent question. It was an interesting process for me. He was working for DARPA, which is um, top secret uh, research done in skiffs and penetrable rooms. And we actually had to demonstrate the amount of light coming from our camera for fear that a weapon could lock in on a single LED. It was established that would not happen. Nothing gets put on, eye, on the eye gaze system. In that configuration, the eye gaze system is output only. So it can be used, it's the only system that can be used in a top secret facility because nothing is installed on the eye gaze system. It would be, it's just like using a manual keyboard. The only difference is you're doing it with your eyes and it's a remote connection. The connection looks like a couple of USB sticks, but they're not, they're called edge links. Basically, you plug one into your eye gaze system, you plug the other one into the computer you want to control, either Windows or Mac, and that's it. You're done. So with computer control, it acts as a remote mouse, but can he see, so if he was, if he, he's an attorney, right? So if he mm -hmm. was um, writing an email, would yep. he just be seeing the text box on his screen and he'd have to look at his other monitor to verify that the text that he was entering went into the email correctly or I guess how does that work to be looking at two different screens? Well you're not looking at two screens at one time. You're either typing in which case everything that you type appears above the keyboard on the eye gaze screen and it appears in the body of the email. So as you write you just look up. If you want to see the whole output you just glance over to where this, the screen is. I'm wondering if there's an easy way to, to, for us to in, in add that somehow. Do you exit this PowerPoint? I can bring up the video. I don't know. If, I, if we exit out of this, Amy, are we going to lose this connection? Um, I'm trying to figure out if, the way to, if there's a way to show a video of that, how that works. <laughs> no, you can. Yeah, there's a share button down at the bottom of Zoom. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, but you still want to control. You just want to stop showing this, right? And show okay. a quick video, which I think Jeremy has on his system. It may take him a few seconds to find it. Okay, uh, well, while, while Jeremy gets set up, um, maybe we can entertain some other questions, one of which was, so 20% off of what? What's the list? The list price is, and I was going to ask Lori precisely what it is. I, it's about uh, $13,000, uh, give or take $500. I've lost track of the precise amount. But um, what I can do certainly is, you know, I think I have every email address for every uh, center so I can send out price sheets to everybody. Um, I should have put that on here, but I didn't want to do that because I was looking for exact numbers. <laughs> and I could, she's been on the phone doing customer support all day. So the well, way what, that <clears throat> what you can do is, um, do you have it on your website? Um, I don't know if we do or not, but can, let's see here. Oh, no, that's not the right one. Well, well, that would work. If you can back that up. Hang on. Let's. I think. I think we're going to try to get this into the, into the program. I think they can see it, right? Are you still there? Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. You can see the screen with the computer on it. Uh, does it have blue boxes, green boxes, yeah. red boxes? Okay. okay. So this is this is a guy named Cliff. We're going to. Are you going to? Can you start it from the beginning? Yeah. This is. We'll just do a few seconds of this. 
Where's the volume? Hang on. Let me give a short demo of it. Okay. So. And more specifically, I have to use a keyboard in the mouse. Still pretty quiet. Yeah, it's very quiet. I'm not able to use a keyboard anymore, and using a mouse is very difficult. He's talking about how exhausting it is to try to use a keyboard. To this. Do you, where's the video that I did, the short one? Uh, you would have to type it in. It's not there? You don't have it? It is. Just can you type in edge links? If you could revoice what he's saying. Hang on. We're going to switch to one that you'll be able to hear. Okay. Cleaning, endurance, overview, these edge link. I think it's this one. This one. Nope, this that's not it. That we did. The one. Let's see. Oh, uh, would it be in here? No. Are there special considerations if if somebody uh, put this in their lending library? Um, I think. We've been talking about that, Amy, because, you know, these things are all over the place. Uh, we have a user manual. We have uh, videos on getting started. We have um, training for, you know, a day of training for some, for an assessment center, which doesn't help you if you're not the person going out. Um, we have support remotely. You can call LC and ask for help setting up the system. I want to take a whole series of, of short training videos, put them on a USB stick and send them out with every system and put those same videos on the desktop of every system. So if you're borrowing a system, you can watch a series of short videos. Probably you need about a five minute how to set it up video to get started. And then you'll have all the information you need and a phone number to call if you need it. So it is conceivable that one of our uh, AT programs could send it out and whoever is assisting the consumer on the other end can get the remote support from you and get familiar with the videos, et cetera. Yes, yes, and that happens all the time. Okay. It certainly happens in countries that we don't want to go to because they're not safe. So. <laughs> My experience has been with, you know, talking to somebody in, used to be Colombia, Colombia is safe now. Now you don't want to go to Venezuela, but um, it certainly is possible to do that, particularly for an uncomplicated case. So someone with ALS typically has eyes that work fine. It's not a problem. It's easy to set up. You know, they're, they're cognitively okay. They're going to just fly on the system. If it's a child with a traumatic brain injury and complex problems, it's not so easy. SMA is trivially easy. Those kids fly on the system. Muscular dystrophy kids fly on the system because their cognition's not affected and their eyes are okay. So, um, but yes, we've done all kinds of remote uh, installations and training. And we're kind of known for that. We're known for good customer support. You know, when there's a snowstorm, the phone lines get transferred to my house and we take all the calls day and night and it's just the way you do it. Okay, Jeremy's got this video now. This is the computer access video. So this is, this will show you how that works. If you want to use the iGaze Edge uh, as a uh, keyboard and mouse to run another computer, a PC, a Mac, a Linux system, basically anything that you can run with a USB keyboard and mouse, you can use that this screen can become nothing more than a keyboard and mouse with the addition of iGaze Edge links. These little gadgets look like USB sticks, but they're not. They're unique to our system, and they can be plugged into any device and run from iGaze. So if I take one of them and plug it into the iGaze system, and plug one into my laptop, and my laptop's a Mac, so you can see that this is how you would run a Mac. Now I'm wirelessly connected this to that. And the program I want to go into is called iGaze Edge Link. So if I look at that key, I've come up with the keyboard. 
And the keyboard looks very much like the communication keyboards in basic eye gaze, except that there's no speak key, now there's a mouse key. So if I look at the mouse key, I bring up a separate program, which will control the direction of the mouse cursor on this screen. The beauty of this is all the controlling is happening here, and you're just looking over there to ensure that the right stuff is happening. Okay, so now I'm on the mouse control screen, and there are several sets of keys, and this is the move mouse keys. There are directional arrows up, down, left, and right. The corner keys are actually diagonal, so you can direct the cursor diagonally or in any direction. And by looking in one of those keys, I can start the action only when my gaze leaves the eye gaze screen. So if I keep looking at that arrow key on the screen, nothing happens. When my gaze leaves the screen to, to look at this computer that I'm uh, operating from it, then I'll see the action happen. And when I want the system to stop the cursor, looking anywhere on the screen, it's a giant stop button. So you don't have to concentrate on, gee, where do I have to look to stop that cursor? It's going to stop automatically as soon as your gaze crosses onto the screen. So if I want to move that mouse up, I'm going to look at the key that with an arrow pointing up. And nothing's going to happen as long as I keep looking at that key. When I take my gaze off the screen, for example, to look over here, the action starts. So by selecting the up arrow, I'm causing that arrow to move up, and I'm just looking at it. When I want it to stop, I'm going to look back on the eye gaze screen, and the entire screen is a stop key. If I want to go down, I'm looking at the key, nothing is happening. I take my gaze off the screen, and now there goes the arrow. It's moving down. I'm going to stop it because I think I want it to go a little faster. I'm going to speed it up a tiny bit and change the speed to four. And you see that the key, the uh, cursor is now moving a little faster down the screen. I'm almost lined up with Word. So let's see if we can get into Word. I'll stop it. I'm going to slow it a bit because I have to do a little bit of an angle. Oh, maybe not. So now I've got the, that cursor highlighted over Word, and I need to double click to enter the program. These are the click mouse keys. This is the left, this is the right. So if I do left, double click, this guy right here, it's going to have the same reaction as if I double clicked on that with a mouse. And you can see I've opened the Word, a Word document. Now I'm gonna go back to type. And the beauty of our keyboards is they're really comfortable to look at. The screens are dark, the keys are color coded so they make a lot of sense. The letter keys are all off white, the number keys are yellow consistently on all the keyboards. So I like this keyboard. I can type on this keyboard all day and my eyes don't get tired. I don't get eye fatigue like I would get looking at a bright screen. So I'm gonna type something on here, but what you'll notice is in real time, the same words are going to appear in that Word document. So let's see, let's do hello. There, how are you? Okay, so I've got some text here, and I've got the same text there. Okay, so you know, I've written my document now. Maybe I'm writing a novel. I would be not the first person to do that with an eye gaze system. Sure there are actually now 12 books that have been written and published by our users. And mm -hmm. they've all been written at using this method. The document is in a standalone computer. It's not in the eye gaze system. And actually, this eye gaze edge system is not even connected to the internet. So there is no risk of a virus. It's just being a keyboard and mouse at this point in time. All right, so I wanna exit out of this program now and I'm gonna use keyboard shortcuts because it makes it a whole lot easier. So the keyboard shortcut to drop down the exit box is Command Q, Command Q. And there it is. Do you wanna save the changes you made to document two? And I don't wanna save it, so I'm gonna type D which is don't save, and I've closed the, the um, document. Okay. So basically, because this is two systems that... I think that's enough to give you a sense of, of um, how it works. Yeah, so 
my, I guess my further question would be, what's the point of window control in the eye gaze system? Um, that would seem like Windows control would be faster if you were in, if you were able to put the software that you wanted on the eye gaze system. But well, you can't do that if you're operating in a skiff. So if you're an, if you're in a secure environment, and you cannot put stuff on your own computer, um, you can't do it. For people do, who are doing lots of writing, I think that keyboards that are within um, the edge links are the most comfortable keyboards and for many people they don't want to store the files in their in their communication system essentially so you can do it either way i would probably choose to do edge links because i'm a mac user and in in my mind there's a lot of stuff in my mac that i like better than in a windows based eye gaze system i probably use the eye gaze system if i was going to order something online from amazon but um for many things, I would not. I would choose to run my Mac. But it's a matter of personal preference. So if it's an employee and they don't want to load load a, a bunch of files onto the iGaze system, then they don't have to. You know, an employer can say, "Well, you know, you can't be putting your putting our files on your personal system." Um, in that case, then just use your personal system as a keyboard and mouse and run them within the the uh, the office computer system. So Nancy, can you summarize some of the key things that people should be thinking about when selecting an eye gaze system in general? Sure. And my things are based on my medical background. The things that are most important to me is the usability. How comfortable is this for the user? How long can they use it? Can they use it in every position that they want to? Um, is it portable? Is it fast? Is it accurate? These are all things that are causes of frustration. Uh, you know, you can use a buy an eye tracker on Amazon, and my, I can guarantee in 15 minutes you're going to be exhausted and not want to do it anymore. And that stuff can't happen in this field. We need to have good, solid technology for people with disabilities. This is your voice, it's got to respond well. And I think we do a really good job of that. This is not a good system for extremely spastic children or adults. The reason is we use a fairly narrow field of view camera. As soon as you widen out the field of view of a camera, you have to add more light to illuminate the eyeball in multiple locations in order to get good accuracy. And we're steering away from that. So, um, it's not the best solution for everybody. Although that said, this used to be the only system out there and we had lots of users with cerebral palsy who were quite spastic who did fine because moving your eyes doesn't cause your body to do anything. It's a whole different part of the nervous system. Eyes come off the brain. So um, once a user with CP who was, had, was spastic or acetoid had experience, they did fine. So what is the language software <clears throat> that is in the system for, for example, a, a child who needs to learn language, or is that not an application you see for your system? We have all of the standard children's programs that come in the grid. So if you're familiar with that, there's Simple Talker, four different versions from simple to complex. Um, complex, I kind of don't understand. If you're that, if you're able to sort that out, you can probably get a keyboard and type. But our early users, children as well as adults, if they were over the age of five, they started out with an alphabetic keyboard and learned how to spell and type. So. Um, at some point, it gets real easy to stick to pictures, and maybe we need to look at that and see if that makes sense. But that we have. Pretty much any program that you wanted to run with our system would work. And this, this is what we provide. In other countries, um, Clicker is used. In Australia, they like Clicker. And in New Zealand, I think they like Clicker. So other stuff will work as well. This is the one that we've chosen. This is, seems to be the program now that's the most often used 
in the United States and one, the one that people are most familiar with. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, last call for any questions. You can either unmute yourself or type it in the text box. Okay, well, Nancy, I think you did a great job of explaining something that can be a little complex to uh, wrap your mind around. Uh, and on the website, there are training materials, educational materials that people can refer to. There are educational materials. All the training videos come with the system. If someone is getting an eye gaze system, we typically um, try to send out a user manual and some and some relevant stuff so they can look at it in advance of, of at the actual training. Our reps, our reps who are all independent, essentially move in for three days. They come to Virginia. They they stay here. They're in the office all day, every day for three days, getting the the expertise necessary. Not that it takes three days to line up a camera and start somebody eye tracking, but it takes three days to understand the stuff that most eye trackers can't handle that ours can and how to make that happen. Great. And when we're ready to write the check, uh, how do we contact um, LC Technologies to let them know that we're affiliated with a state AT program and want the discount? Um, What's the best can, way to do that? You can call 1-800-EYE-GAZE, E-Y-E-G-A-Z-E. -E. Um, you can type info at eyegaze.com. You could type nancy at eyegaze.com. You could type Mickey Mouse at eyegaze.com and it will get to the right source um, to, to make that happen. So right. if, you, if you state that you're from a, a, um, a center, an assessment center, a state assessment center, then if there's any question, just I'm the nurse. I'm the only nurse here. So if you forget my name, it doesn't matter. Just say, well, gee, I saw something that a nurse from your company talked about and then it'll come to me, but that should not be an issue. Okay. Anybody that wants precise, detailed information on the cost, I apologize that I didn't have the right, I, I didn't count on Lori being on board <laughs> all day. Um, but if you want a, a quote with an exact price, nancy at eyegaze.com and I'll get one sent out to you. Okay, great. So we'll be sure to share that information with all the people in our demonstration uh, and lending community of practice. So thanks everyone, look forward to uh, receiving an evaluation link and uh, sorry for the few technical difficulties in getting started. So Nancy, thanks again. And uh, everybody look forward to seeing you at our next webinar, which is in June and seeing some of you in person later this month. Bye now. Thank you, bye.